The Portland State Oral, I'm sorry, Portland State University Oral History Project focuses on Oregon's land use planning program. It provides the opportunity for key participants to recount stories and anecdotes regarding how this unique program was developed, implemented, and evolved over its more than four decades in existence. It is June 20th, 2017. My name is Michael Rupp. I'm a former member of the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Also here is my former colleague of the Department of Land Conservation and Development, Jim Knight, uh, and Professor Cy Adler of Portland State. Uh, we will be interviewing Elton Hout, former Deputy Director with the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and former County Commissioner of Washington County. Welcome, Elton, and thanks for agreeing to be interviewed. Mike, was it 2017 or 18? I'm sorry, 2018. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Well, sorry. I didn't pick that up. I didn't pick that up. Well, thanks for the invitation. Yeah, we've been meeting to do this for a while, so it's good that we were able to catch up with you. Uh, could you give us a brief personal background of you and your family settlement and life here in Oregon? Three of my grandfathers were here in the 1880s. One of them was here before that. Wow. And that goes, that uh, is the Lewis family, which actually goes back, are you ready for this, to Meriwether Lewis. Wow. Ancestry.com is wonderful. We've got a daughter that works through this stuff. Uh -huh. So uh, I think my, uh, my roots are pretty deep here, yeah. and uh, that's been a part of, of my life, I think, is, is understanding that, seeing what's happened. My, my uh, grandfather uh, on my mother's side had a farm in the Millersburg area that his father had started. Uh, my other grandfather was a cattle man and uh, a prune farmer and a, and a butcher and a hardware man. In those days, people had lots of jobs. I didn't realize that very frequently. My grandfather would go out over to Newport, buy cattle, drive them back, put them up on Baldy, which is outside of Corvallis, and then take them down to the slaughterhouse on the Willamette River, which I'm sure didn't meet any DBQ requirements <laughs> at the time, and eventually got him into, into his butcher shop yeah. that she had with his brother. So, long, long answer, but I go back a ways. Okay, and? Uh, fourth generation, at least. Let's talk about your professional background. Uh, my academic background is in political science and public administration and international affairs. Um, I, uh, I came out of graduate school and decided I better make some money. So I started teaching at Pacific University at a fairly young age. I was I'm 28 at the time and um, enjoyed my 10 years as a college teacher teaching political science. And at the same time, given the facts that Washington County was a home rule charter county which had part-time commissioners, in a, a moment of audacity, convinced by my next door neighbor, I ran a write-in candidate for county commissioner on the Republican side. The Democrats had a fight going on. The incumbent dairy farmer, a great guy, was being challenged by one of my colleagues at Pacific, an economics professor, who was maybe the most widely despised man on the faculty. <laughs> and there was the, he won the primary. Uh, but they, as a protection, I ran as a, as a uh, writing candidate, got 400 write-in votes, and beat heck out of him in the, in the general election. Basically, the fellow that got beat in primary endorsed me. And something I didn't learn until much later in life is that my name, Hout, is Dutch for wood. And out in western Washington County, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Dutch Catholics in the dairy business and basically doing farming. I don't think that hurt me at all. <laughs> so that's, uh, and from there I went, uh, moved on to. What, what uh, year was that about? What's that? What year? I, uh, I was elected in 1966. Okay. My term as county commissioner was the exact eight years that Tom Call was governor, the wonder years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark Hatfield was elected to the Senate that year. It was a sweep of what we 
then thought of as moderate Republicans in the state of Oregon. Uh, it was a, my friend Jim Klonowski from the University of Oregon, now gone, used to say, oh, Oregon's a one, modified one-party state, Republican. <laughs> How things change. Yeah, for sure. So I did that, and, and I served on the, uh, on, the, on the commission and taught uh, for uh, about eight years uh, as, a, as a commissioner and uh, 10 years as a teacher. Okay, and then you ended up in Craig. So let's well, I, while I was on the uh, county commission, I did take part in the regional activities that involved uh, the metropolitan statistical area. Basically, it was a metropolitan uh, transportation planning as it was the start of all this. And it involved Clackamas County, uh, Multnomah County, Washington County, and in the Craig situation, and for transportation purposes, Clark County, Washington. And I, I sat on the Craig board, as chairman of the Craig board, and also worked with uh, former uh, colleague Lloyd Anderson, uh, to, uh, and uh, an attorney by the name of Herb Hardy, to put through the initial legislation that created the Metropolitan Service District. Uh, that was one of the last things I did as a, as a county commissioner. Tough, tough battle. And we know what happened from then on. So that was, uh, that was my local experience. The most important thing that I did, I think, as a county commissioner was to participate and do my part for Washington County to adopt a comprehensive land use plan, mm -hmm. which we didn't have to do. But we did have to do it, because if you remember, in that period of time, the population increase was formidable. Yeah. We had problems, we had an expiring uh, exclusive, land, uh, exclusive uh, agricultural protection zoning. We had to get something in place. Uh, and it was a classic case of trying to uh, separate the resource land from the urban and urbanizable land, protect the ag land, basically to be able to justify the development of the Scoggins Dam project that we had worked so hard for. Have a dam project for irrigation and no land to irrigate mm -hmm. would have been a pretty sad situation. We got that in place, tough battle. I went to somewhere close to 40 public meetings myself along with our planning uh, commission chairman, who was my, fortunately, was my next door neighbor, so we could go in the same car. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we put it in place. And we were blessed with, a, with uh, as a county commissioner, with a lot of planning talent. Our county extension agent, Palmer Torvent, had been to Europe and had seen the values of contained communities. Um, Dale Johnson, who later became with the housing folks, uh, was a per first class planner. And uh, uh, then finally, uh, Martin Crampton, who was the guy that really put it all together, so effective that he got hired away to Multnomah County after he had done the Washington County Comprehensive Plan. And uh, first class guy. What was the time period again for this? Well, it's towards the end of my time, so it would be. What? Um, before El before Sentinel? Before, before I uh, made the move down to Salem to work with uh, the land. This Brandy's is all Committee. before Senate Bill 100, too? Probably. Oh, yeah, yeah, well before okay. Senate Bill 100. As I said, we didn't have to do this. Yes. Okay. And as you know, in uh, parts of Oregon at that time, zoning was questionable. Yes. People in Clackamas County didn't get over it for years. And uh, we had uh, some zones uh, in place, and we had, uh, as I say, a population increase that was formidable. And we were, as a county commissioner, we were sitting every week, uh, probably for four or five hours, and at least on three of those uh, meetings a week, uh, per, three of those per month, we were doing 35 and 40 zone changes. Wow. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. We figured that out real fast. We got to get a plan and we've got to get implementing ordinances, and we've got to do the thing that uh, is in the, basically is in the textbooks and, and get on with it, and we did. Not without a lot of pain. Sure. Always difficult. Could you say a few more words about Martin Crampton? Because he does go on to be planning directly in Multnomah County, so for him to be 
planning director of the two most populous communities right. in the state during that critical 1970s yeah. period. Yeah. Well, he was a no-nonsense, uh, all-business kind of a guy who uh, was a good communicator because he, he spoke in very simple terms. We went through the basically the, uh, I guess it's a variation of the Ian McCarks, uh, putting down the various layers of constraint. Design with nature. Yeah, designing with nature, uh, starting with, uh, you know, so you can start with uh, the uh, wildlife pattern. And you get to some certain logical conclusions about what ought to be protected and what you can let go. And uh, he took us through that, that process. And we had some really good, uh, uh, really good educational experiences with him, and I assume he did the most for, for Washington, for Multnomah County as well. Just a super talented guy, and uh, a pleasant person to deal with, and, and a hard, very hard worker, and the people that worked for him uh, appreciated him. So uh, I can't say enough about his role. We also had another secret weapon, and that was Ed Sullivan, our county council, who was uh, as committed to the land use process as, as anyone, as anyone ever has been. And uh, that, was a, that was a great team of, uh, of talent, plus a board that was ready to go. It's always nice to have a situation, and I had this for eight years as a county commissioner. I always had the votes. Wow. I always had at least three and usually four. So we could, we could move ahead and uh, do what needed to be done. Okay, let's see, then you move on to DLC. Well, you started. at that, I had a small a family and I had a teaching position and I had a county commission position. The teaching position at that time was a basically a combination of, of uh, of uh, tenure and poverty, <laughs> and uh, I didn't think that was sustainable. And I was uh, talking with uh, Lessa Coyne, who was uh, a member of our legislature at that time and a good friend of Ted Halleck's, and, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, Ted's ca casting around for uh, somebody to chair the, or to be the executive secretary of the Joint Land Use Committee. You might want to talk to him about that. So I did, and in his obscene way, he uh, exploded over the telephone and told me, hey, why hadn't I called him earlier and all of that? And eventually it worked out. He was talking with some other people, but eventually it worked out, and, and I went down and started with him in February of, this must have been February of 74, and uh, was on the job when uh, Arnold Kogan had been hired, Herb Riley, and a couple of other, Mel Lucas, and a couple of others from, uh, from the uh, uh, Bob Logan shop over at Intergovernmental Affairs, and put together the beginnings of the, of the, uh, the staff that eventually started the rounds of uh, meetings around the state, three rounds of at least 30 meetings, I think, around yeah, goal uh, to, to develop the goals. And I rode along with them on uh, a couple, most of them, not, not some of the absurd uh, travel that uh, our lead, fearless leader, L.B. Day, had us do. Uh, I think uh, one, one trip involved uh, a day run from, I think, Pendleton to Coos Bay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> But that was nothing. That was nothing. And you worked on New Year's Eve and did a whole lot of and Christmas Eve and a whole lot of things. But you got the job done, yeah. and uh, it was not uh, without a whole lot of uh, effort by a whole lot of people and a whole lot of miles and a whole lot of meetings. But without those meetings, without those three rounds of, of uh, public involvement, the project wouldn't have had any legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you can, it, it's a beautiful piece of legislation, and uh, well, we had great political leadership, uh, but without support at the, at the local level, and it wasn't always there, and in some places of the state it wasn't ever there, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it seemed 
expensive and it seemed time consuming, but it was, it was important. Um, Senate Bill 100 created a framework for land use planning across the state. Based on this legislation, the statewide planning goals were drafted as an expression of the state's policy interest in local land use planning. Do you believe the Land Conservation and Development Commission correctly addressed the objectives of the Senate Bill 100 through the creation of the 19 planning goals, statewide planning goals? Well, uh, they can leave out 16, 17, 18, and 19 because they're not really addressed in the statute much, a little bit, but not much, and neither is the Greenway goal. But I think if you look at, uh, I think if you look at 1 through 14, with the exception of goal 13, energy conservation, they're all in Senate Bill 100. And I think that's one of the reasons that the, the, the program has hung together as well as it has. It is, it is um, a, connective, a connectivity there and a legitimacy of connection between what the legislature wanted and what the process administratively developed. And I think that's, again, key to the, to the uh, legitimacy of the, of the product and the acceptance of the product. So, uh, yeah, I think that there's a, uh, there's a very close relationship. And the, as I said, the beauty of it is it was in the Senate Bill 100. Yeah. That's, that's a fine piece of legislation. Can you talk a little bit about the development of Senate Bill 100? Is I, was in the, I was at the county level at that time okay. and uh, did testify on behalf of it, testified that the coordinating bodies ought to be regional governments or regional like Craig or right. Elcog or those places. Uh, it turned out later that uh, to get the bill through, they had to compromise and, and uh, give it to counties, which was, I think, a real hit or miss operation. There was it was as good as the co as the coordinator that was hired, and in some cases they weren't very good, and in some cases the coordination wasn't very good. But that was a product. That was something that had to be done to get the legislation through. Yeah. Um, uh, wasn't fatal, probably kept the Association of Oregon Counties on board to support the legislation, yeah. and, the and the League of Oregon Cities did not support the legislation. Oh, is that right? You might want to talk to Bill Young about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, your role with the key legislators that were well, at that time. Um, Ed, Ed this was pretty much of an inside baseball kind of a thing and, and we came and you know people from the outside came and went and made their testimony and, and argued uh, for for or against it and, and, and again certain things are because they know where you're coming from are fairly well discounted to begin with. Oh Washington County, well they've got a comprehensive plan, they believe in planning. We'll set that aside but we will be interested in what you have to say. Uh, uh, it was get really. It was you know. I was getting the fourth vote uh, on a committee to get it out uh, to get it out of committee, and uh, that was uh, uh, that was important. And it didn't. It wasn't easy. And that was the the sleight of hand and uh, cajolery and just plain brilliance of Ted Halleck in terms of being able to get those those votes to get it out and then to take it over to the Senate, to the House and never change a comma or a, or a, yeah. or a period and get it back and get it signed. So there was a, I, I did my part in terms of uh, being very supportive of it. Uh, my, my major contribution I think comes later in terms of uh, uh, working both at the, in the Land Use Committee, Oversight Committee, and protecting what had been passed. Remember we had, as you were, all may know we had to vote on this damn thing who three times. Who were the three votes? Oh, the Jack Ripper was the, was the key. Was he really? Yeah. And um, I'd have to go back and look at the at the at the record, but I can't. I, and that's something that's important to find out. Uh, it was. Uh, I wasn't there at the time. Mm -hmm. I can tell you about the dynamics of the committee later on, uh, which was basically protection. The next one, I, after I served with the, uh, as, on the oversight function, I also worked for Ted as his, uh, as his uh, uh, administrative assistant in the 75 legislature. And there was an attempt by none other than Vic Atia to get 
the goals adopted or to be them have them referred to the legislature. Mm -hmm. Desk drawer along with my bottle of Jack Daniels and Oreo cookies that I kept there for both me and for Ted and for Jackie as well. And it stayed there the whole session. It never had a hearing. <laughs> There's some power in the chair. Yeah. Even, even though Ted was compromised, he didn't get along with Jason Bowe, the president of the Senate, all that much. And he, he, he always had to fight for the extra vote. One of the votes that he often got was George Wingard, uh, re Republican senator yeah, from Lane Wayne County. County. Yeah. Good man. Yeah. There's actually a historic piece I got from the archives, which is online, that's an interview with Ted Halleck. Yeah. And he's got a whole section on Senate Bill 100. Okay, well, there's... there's it's fascinating. He talked yeah. all about the 4 to 3 vote, yeah. Jack Ripper, Nicotia, yeah. all those things you yeah. mentioned. Yeah, it was... In his own words. Interesting, time, interesting times. Uh, also in that 75 uh, legislature, I, I ran across a guy who was... Uh, a leader of that uh, of that uh, group, and had it been a stronger leader in the past, a man by the name of Al Flagle. Oh yeah, Senator Al Flagle, who subsequently became a commissioner in uh, Douglas County. Uh, Douglas, Douglas County. I first knew Al. And uh, also had an assignment. L. B. Day knew all of these old guys from the previous legislative experience, who became kind of a troubleshooter for for him. And a story, this is, this is the way things worked in those early days. I, I think it was, I was with Mel Lucas and, and, and uh, with uh, Alf Flagle when we were up in, we were up in uh, Columbia County visiting the courthouse. Hiram Johnson was the uh, county commissioner of, of importance up there. And Hiram was an old logger and had uh, only had one arm. He'd lost part of an arm in the, in the logging business. And uh, Al got serious about him, and he looked at he looked at Hiram, and he said, "You know, Hiram, you listen to these boys. They've got a lot to tell you, and if you don't agree with them, I'm going to come back here and take off your other arm." Yeah. I think I've heard that story before. <laughs> he was that way. He, he was a character. I got along with him fine. Most of the staff got along with him quite well. But he was a real curmudgeon in lots of ways. When I started, old time labor guy. When I started in Douglas County, Al was one of the county. Yeah. He had a heart attack. He used to uh, be in the legislature. Yeah. Had to had to retire. Right. Came back to Roseburg. Um, I got hired, and this was at the time when the planning commission decided who the planning director was. It wasn't the board. Uh. And um, when I got hired, Keith Kubik, who was not even the director at the time, yeah, took. Jim Mann and I up to visit Al Flagle and introduce him. And Al says, you two young whippersnappers, you look like two fine young men. I hope you get paid. And we, we, we walked out of there and we looked at Keith and said, what do you mean? Oh, we just got hired. What do yeah. you mean? And he said, well, we have a fight going on in the planning commission and the board of commissioners. Uh, and um, the planning director at the time, Richard Van Orman. I don't know yes, Dick Van Orman, yeah. yeah a good guy. Uh, Stanford Buell was the was, Stanford Buell was another county commissioner. Yeah, and I took a ride right in the forest with that guy. Boy, was that a high, high point. I didn't know I was going to live Alan, or die. Al and Stanford were both Democrats. Well, Stanford wanted to subdivide his ranch. Uh, and the planning commission was dead set against yeah. him. So Richard signed the plat because that's who he worked for, and the planning commission fired him. And poor Richard was out. They hired both of us. Yeah. And uh, and Cubic was the director. No, not yet. Not, not yet. No, uh, no. They hired him. Actually, his name was uh, Dick Reynolds, who was there. I don't think he was only there for like a year. Oh, okay. And uh, he used to be an intern with Douglas County. I mean, they just yeah. Dick, you're the planning director. Huh. He wasn't even. He was just trying to be there as a summer job, and he ended up getting the job. Well, as you know, in those days, Douglas County had more money than Midas. They oh, could yeah. do whatever they wanted to. Yeah, they did. No but tax base. Al turned around and went back to the legislature that same year. In fact, I think they closed the period for bills. Uh -huh. And so he grabbed the bill, ripped it out, and they put in this thing where the Board of Commissioners would mm -hmm. hire and fire the planning director. And all that happened from this Oh, okay, because this is General Law County, so it had to be in statute. Yeah. In fact, it was going on in Tillamook County at the same time. Yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah. So uh, just. Uh, 
Well, they, th that dynamic between the board yeah, and, was, and the planners uh, uh, yeah. uh, was a statewide problem. Uh, oftentimes, it didn't happen. Didn't happen in Multnomah County. A fairly professional operation yeah. there, not without their own politics, but uh, they were supportive. Yeah, Columbia County, uh, Clatsop County. Uh, Hiram was Clatsop County. I made a mistake. It wasn't Columbia County. It was Clatsop County. When did Al come to the department? What's that? When did Al Burns come to? to no, you mean Al Flagle. Flagle, excuse me. Yeah. Well, when did it when, had to be right at? The well, when did his term in, in Douglas County end? Well, it was probably let's see, seventy-eight maybe. Yeah. Like that. He was on OCC and DC. Right. Al was yeah. member. Right. Do you remember that very much, OCC and DC? Yeah. Got it abolished. Yeah, but Ted and I got it abolished. Talk about it. In '75, they this was an unbelievable. Wilbur didn't like that very much. Wilbur is gone now, and he has no no say in that. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of those sedulous group of. I mean, you, yeah. Did you was, go to some of their meetings? Oh, yeah, Jim Ross must have gotten fired four or five times. Oh. And uh, came back uh, again and again. That's where I got to know Jim because he was always pulling his hair out. It was like <laughs> you're hurting cats. Yeah. They had you had a couple county or well you had local a local I think local representation from all, all the counties. Yeah. And then you had also port districts. Uh, in, yeah, ports were on there, right? And then you had the governor's six, and you had people like Ann Squire and Ellen Lowe and some other people that were real talented folks and kept that thing on yeah, center for what it did. And the, the OCC and D staff was quite talented. They were very good. And they got together some very good inventory work. Yeah. Uh, they couldn't, of course, do any policy making, really. They, uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a debating society, but they did a lot of good, uh, a little groundwork in, in that way. That, came over with Jim when he moved over to yeah. LCDC, but boy, uh, Ted said, we got to get rid of those people. And I think um, LB uh, Day was also very much interested in shutting down that power yeah. uh, source, yeah. and we did it. Uh, without much trouble. Weren't they, what, 30 people? On the oh, God, it was unwieldy. Yeah. yeah, all sorts of subcommittees and uh, it was a, it was an oddball operation, yeah. but it was a. I think it was a probably Bob Logan, Tom McCall sop to the to the coastal communities to keep them occupied, yeah. <laughs> if not satisfied. And um, well, remember, there was the Coastal Zone Management Act. Well, there was. Federal nineteen right. Yeah, and that was in re and there was money available. Money for planning. Yeah, yeah. and they did it, they did good inventory work. And I think they also got some HUD money, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Did they? Uh, so, can we go yeah. back to the 73 session for a moment? Sure. Senate Bill 769 also passes during the 73 session, and that's the one that creates the Crag Regional Planning District. So you're still on 769. The board. Yeah. 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 Do you remember? The discussion around that bill, the connection between uh, LC. I think Akia went, went through the Melissa, roof yeah. on that one. That's right. Uh, and Ted stepped away from it because he was more interested in um, in the big the big picture. And 769 was basically the uh, it was the brainchild of Don Hus Senator Don Husband from from Lane County. He was a he was a guy that was fairly interested in regional issues. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right. Uh, that was, um, we didn't get involved with that until, well, just a minute now, 769? Yeah, so yeah. When you were on Craig. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, that's, had, that's the end. Uh, you had that, something called the Action and Direction Committee, Jane Cease, yeah. before she entered the legislature was a civic activist. Oh, yeah. He was the chair of that committee. And so Craig, from within Craig emerged the yeah. bill. Well to create a regional planning district. Yeah. That's and that's the Metropolitan Service District. No. That's the MSD other bill. was already in place. Oh, okay. MSD was already Oh yeah, because MSD was 
enabled by the legislature in 69 and is approved by the voters in 1970. They never gave it a tax base, so it couldn't do much of anything. But MSD was already there. A lot. There's a gleam in some people's eyes <laughs> about merging MSD and CRAG. Oh, yeah. But that's a little ways down the road. Yeah. Uh, well, I was uh, I'm, I'm trying to think that that's the same vehicle, and the, the number sounds the same, that uh, Lloyd Anderson and I worked so hard yes, to get yes, passed, and her Lloyd party was the, was the pro bono attorney that helped us out on that. And later it got constituted, and I was the chairman of that as well for a while. And we were basically focusing on solid waste disposal in the early days. Well, that was MSD. Yeah, it's MSD. But CRAG was not only doing no, transportation was... planning, but it was required to do a regional comprehensive plan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All the urban growth. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Know what you're saying. yeah. MSD was more of a, a fun functional yeah. activities. So, and, so, yeah, CRAG had that responsibility. And that was one of the problems that we had in terms of Craig leadership. And the, the problem was that there was never enough money to do anything worthwhile. <laughs> and I remember Lloyd Anderson said, and Homer Chandler, I think, was the uh, director Chandler at that time. Exactly he said, if, if I went to Homer Chandler and said he had Five hundred dollars to plan the metropolitan area. He tried to he tried to do it, but it would be a fool's errand. And basically, that whole argument about doing a regional comprehensive plan, well, it, it evaporated because we didn't have the resources. Now I don't know what penalties were pay, paid as a result of that, <clears throat> but there wasn't that much support. Uh, for that, it would have taken something more than just federal money, which was really what fueled uh, Craig at that time. Uh, it would have taken some contribution and some buy-in from the local uh, jurisdiction. That was not about to happen in those days. So that, yeah, okay, I, 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 I don't remember all this stuff, you know. Because <laughs> Vicatia in the 75 He hated that legislation. Submitted a bill to abolish That's right. Craig. That regional planning. That's correct. He did not like it at all. Why was that? Yeah. Or well, because it would actually do something. Why it had the authority to do something. I made a comment at one point, and it's in the paper, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I said, you know, um, I think the, le the legislation allows for the Metropolitan Service District to take over TriMet. Yes, it did. And maybe we should yeah. consider that. Oh! that just the world came to an end right then. And I got a lot of airtime on that one, I can tell you. <laughs> Metro was supposed to take over TriMet when yeah. it was created. Oh, the new, the existing Metro. Yeah. They work pretty close together, I think, don't they? They do, they do. But they, the assumption was yeah. that they were going to take over yeah. I. I'm not, so I distract here, right? I'm not sure that makes at the same time. Yeah, I'm not sure that makes any sense now or then. You know, that yeah. that span of control issue gets kind of wonky, it right. seems to me. Metro had a board, right? So that what's it had a board, Metro, right? Yeah. That, that actually was like the No, it was a board, it was governing body, right? Yeah. But then there was staff, right? Uh not really. The crags crag people would yeah, help out. The staff were no, but I'm saying there was a, a director and some oh, yeah. subordinate people. For a Metropolitan Service District? Well, well or Craig was it? Oh, Craig, oh yeah, Craig had a huge, uh, not huge, but they had a large staff. And yeah, you, they, then they had a board, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they have one today, in fact. Was it five or four? Uh, or five? No. It was five people back, five back when then. MSD was created. Yes, yeah. But Craig was five? Oh, no, 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 I figured. Because it was, it was uh, Clackamas, Multnomah, Washington, Clark, cities and counties represented. Right. So there were, if I'm remembering correctly, 42 votes oh, okay. on the Crag board because it was weighted by Wait, all yeah. the okay. Yeah, in terms of big, big decisions. 21 of the 42 
So and the cities and counties within the region had pieces of the remaining 21. I'm not sure, you know, that's what's tr technically true, but I'm not sure that that was ever put into play very often. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, collegiality, typically, on that board. And, uh, for a while, at least, yeah. Not so much after you leave. <laughs> but, you know, Bob Schumacher from, uh, from down in Clackamas County and uh, uh, Lloyd Anderson, and I think before that it was Dave Eccles, uh, was uh, on that board and uh, uh, one of the one of the finest men I ever met in uh, in public life was David Eccles, County Commissioner from Multnomah County. He was the most thoughtful uh, guy, and I uh, I could run across. Uh, who was not mayor, a politician? Who was the mayor of Portland at that time? Uh, Terry Shrunk to Terry begin Shrunk. with. Um, yeah. Well, Goldschmidt will become. And then Luke came in later, later. yeah. Goldschmidt came. He came in at the end, yeah, at the end of my term. Right. In, so in, yeah, in he'll be 74, 75. He'll be through. I have. Uh, I'll tell you, a great. We had a, one, of the, one of the other accomplishments at the county was we built a new uh, county uh, building and a new jail. And uh, we dedicated that, and we had all of the people from all of the public officials from or uh, all the cities in in uh, Washington. Washington County and Neil came because there's a there's a very small segment of Portland city of Portland in Washington County and I introduced all of the all of the uh, members of the mayors from the various cities and and I said and we're very lucky to because we have a rep, the mayor of Washington County's smallest city. <laughs> so, Neil, would you stand up? <laughs> he loved it. He loved it. Yes. There. Now, that, that's a circle that I, I, I want to fill for the record. Ted Halleck was the most interesting and one of the brightest guys I ever ran into in public life. We'll talk more about him later. David Eccles, whom I just mentioned, was about as good as it gets. The absolute most brilliant public official I ever dealt with was Neil Goldschmidt. Really? This guy was something else. What made him so good in your mind? Well, he was always about three steps ahead of everybody. He really was. I mean, he, he thought, you ask him a dumb question, he'd give you an answer that was really thoughtful. Thought, he, he was just an amazing, amazing guy with it endless amounts of energy and uh, scare people, I think. Scare people. Scare people with his, with his energy and his drive. And I think the city of Portland, certainly the downtown area, looks a lot the way it does because of what he's done, uh, did, which made all the more tragic. I was in D.C. When, when the story came out and I, I was physically sick. He was what, sick, was he? He had uh, decided not to run for governor a okay. second time. Yes. And uh, uh, it was, um, I was working for Noah. I was back there on the Noah gig, I think. And uh, I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't handle it. It was it's a guy that is that talented and he's gone from public Was it suicide? You know, no, no. He had a, it was public suicide. Yeah. 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 What? He had a sex scandal. Yeah, a scandal. He was sleeping with the babysitter for yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to go into I'm the details, <laughs> but it was it was I'll just see. it was just I, I, I don't know. Uh, but he's just a, a brilliant, brilliant character. Now, I can't say that about too many people in the legislature yeah. uh, that I ran across. Certainly, there were some able, able people in the, in the times that I that I was. Uh, one of my assignments is uh, when I went to work for LCDC later on was the liaison with the with the legislature and uh, got to work with some some good people, a lot of good people. Nobody at that, nobody at the Dave Eccles, Neil Goldschmidt level, nobody. Local government's got some good people in it, and they get short shrift, and uh, it's too bad. 
Well, government gets short shrift these days, and yeah. it's too bad. Cause That's a whole other discussion. Yeah, we all know that there's a lot of people out there that are basically subsidizing the taxpayer by the work that they do. They're just good. Where are we going? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals themselves. Okay. So, of the 19 statewide planning and accomplishing the objectives of the state land use. How, how many do I get to list? Uh, you've got the list of <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, obviously, in terms of substance, I would say three, four, five, and 14. Because okay. that really is what it's all about, in my judgment. It's the question of protecting resources on the one hand and providing for urban and urbanizable land in an, in an orderly manner on the other hand. So I guess you'd have to throw in goal two. That. You listed <laughs> goal two. Goal two, yeah. You listed agricultural lands, which is three. Agricultural land and forestry. And then resources. And then and res the resources. Right? And then uh, and then the urbanization goal. 14. Yeah, 14. I, I uh, the, leaving out the coastal goals, for which are a special case, and they address special needs, and they're good, and they're well done, and uh, uh, they're valuable. They're, they're on a different plane. They are. Yeah, they're the first 14. And the first 14 are, with the exception of uh, uh, goal 13, which is put in there for the city of Portland's benefit, as I recall, Neil Goldschmidt again, uh, they're, they're right out of Senate Bill 100. And that's, to me, that's the crystallization of the state values. Senate Bill 100. Yeah. And Goal 15, mark with that. Well, yeah. That, but yeah. different people have different views of what that should have been. Yeah. The Greenway Goal. The Greenway Goal. I think it's uh, actually not been too badly uh, uh, mutilated. In fact, there's some communities that have recaptured their their well, river, right? My hometown of Corvallis, for example, has come back on First Street, and it's pretty pleasant down there. That's great to hear that. Yeah. And of course, Salem's water. Sa yeah. You know, with the, the, the new bridge yeah. across there, and uh, just all the other kinds of enhancements. Yeah. Right it's, so it's had its ups and downs. It was never going to be two trails on both sides of the river from Portland to, no. to Eugene. Sorry, Bob Straw, but that's not the way it's going to be. And some people in his orbit never got over that. Oh, there is a nice statue of Governor McCall. Yeah, yeah. McCall. Well, he's Bob Straub is valuable for many other things. But it's great to see Governor McCall. On <laughs> well, didn't you bring in a big fish? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's my answer to the the question of the, of the goals. I did have a comment earlier. I think about uh, Goal One, the Citizen Involvement Goal, and without it. And without the legitimacy of an opportunity, and let's face it, it's an opportunity to participate. Mm -hmm. And we, God knows, had a lots of opportunities to participate. And we opened up, I think, through goal one, and lots of opportunities to participate at the local level. Without that, uh, you're on a, on a kind of a, a foundation that could crumble away from you. But if you've got public support, there's a, there's a lot of flexibility of well, things you can do, and lots of experiments you can make. They had a good committee, too, for Goal 1. It was. It was a committee that was uh, committed to the idea of, uh, of providing opportunity. Some ways a reaction to the way things... And I have to admit, I, when I went into politics to begin with, I was part of that old school. We, we made deals over at the Congress Hotel all the time in the back room. <laughs> Uh, Mike Gleason and uh, whoever was uh, from the city of Portland and uh, uh, whatever it took to, to get things done. And um, that's a long way from uh, uh, moving now to uh, not have two, two commissioners can't show up at the same meeting. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting and it's beneficial. It's beneficial. And without, without that having done that, and it just drove you nuts. I, I mean, all of us that were involved in it, those people would drive you nuts sometimes. It had, it had to be a, an essential part of the success of the program. I don't know how those things are functioning now. It'll be interesting to know. Is there even a state committee anymore? Yes, CIAC. Yes. CIAC. Yeah. CIAC. I believe so. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, no, one of our graduates was on it. Yeah. Chairs it. Good. 
Michael and I are sort of out of it these days. Yeah. In terms of the working day to day. Uh, Craig, before. Uh, let's see. One of the goals. One of the goals that uh, is uh, there and is kind of a tender issue and it's something we ought to be paying a lot more attention to given uh, what's happening demographically and that's the housing goal. Oh. Uh, and how you grapple with that is I think extremely difficult. Uh, we're over in Vancouver we're, we're, we're dealing with that. I know the city of Portland is dealing with it to the extent that uh, they're encouraging uh, grandmother apartments and uh, uh, rentals of rooms and yeah. things, you know, Airbnbs and all sorts of things. And my uh, son-in-law went in to get a, a permit to do a remodel on his house and he said, God, I got out of there in about 90 minutes. Bam, bam, approval. And he was, he was, he was flabbergasted that he could get through the process that fast and add a, basically an Airbnb, uh, Airbnb. So that's, that's going to be a sore, sore point and it's going to be tough. Um, following up on that particular question, which one of the goals do you have, do you feel have been the least important? The least important? Yeah, in other words, energy problem. Yeah, probably a goal 13. <laughs> now, what, that that what do you do with it? That was developed during the energy crisis. It was during the energy crisis. The city of Portland wanted it. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, we, and they basically wrote it, I think, uh, uh, but uh, it was, it's something that, you know, re 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 requires a state or expression or national solution yeah. or international solution. It's not a, certainly t uh, local codes uh, providing for uh, solar and wind and those kinds of things can, can go. I think that uh, Oregon's probably in the forefront of most of that anyway. So, but I, at the at the local planning level, I think it's probably not as important as some of the other ones. As you look back over the last forty years, which of the state's natural resources do you believe the state planning program has been the most successful in protecting? I think we've done a pretty good job protecting Angland, and I. If you talk to the Thousand Friends people, they'll, they'll give you the statistics on that. But I know that I uh, travel the back roads still quite a bit. One of the places I go almost every other year is down to St. Paul Rodeo. And I go in through the back way and the hop fields are still there. That soil is still there and being used. And if I'm not mistaken, the, south, the town of St. Paul, at one point, some years ago, decided that their urban growth boundary was too big, and they reduced it because they wanted to protect the agricultural land that surrounds that little village. And the county went along with it. What's that? The county agreed. And the county agreed. <clears throat> yeah, they're not going to. It's not going to be a high population growth area anyway, and that land there between St. Paul and Newburgh and then all the way out to Donald and out to the freeway, and then you can carry the ish soils that are down farther. Mm -hmm. that's, that's important. And I think that's, a, to me, that's kind of the canary in the, in the mine, uh, that uh, we're, we're still doing a pretty good job of protecting egg land. What about goal 14? Well, you know, you go back and forth with that, don't we? Huh? Well, we do, but on the other hand, I think, and I may be wrong, but I think that the original Metropolitan Service District, or uh, the original boundary in the, in the, in the region, uh, Portland, and I know the boundary in Washington County, has maintained a fair degree of integrity, that there has not been the leapfrog development that we were all worried about back in the 70s, partly because I think local officials have finally figured out that it's costly to do that. And that was always the appeal of com, you know, compact urban form was that it's cheaper to service. Uh, and so I think that uh, urban growth boundaries generally uh, have maintained their integrity. We're the only state in the union that has UGBs. Yeah. Around every, every place. And I, 
I don't know, uh, I'd, w I'd wonder about places like how, how well it's happening in Bend and places that are under real severe population. thousand people now. Yeah. But I know that in Washington County, of course, is, you know, from my time sure. to now is very dramatically different. I go out there, I don't know where I am most of the time. Uh, interesting story, a planning story. Back in the days when we, uh, I may have told this before, but I put it on the record. When I was uh, uh, in, the, in the county business, the vice president of Tektronix came around one afternoon with a couple of guys. And he said, these fellows are from California. Uh, this is Andy Grove, and this is, uh, I'll come up with the other name in a minute. Uh, uh, and they uh, were interested in, they want to build a plant up here. And I said, well, well, what is it that they need? Well, they need water, they need electricity, they need good location, and they don't want, they don't want a big hassle. I said, well, let's go down to the planning office and see what, we had our comprehensive plan in place at that time. Let's go down and see what we've got. How big a place do you want? How big? So we went down there and they stayed a while and uh, came back and uh, Gordon Moore was the other guy. Gordon Moore and Andy Grove. Came back and uh, I think we can do business here. This was the two guys at the top of Intel. Wow. They came in and built a new plant in Aloha. The first plant that was built in Aloha. And they came because they could come without any difficulty. It was ready to go. Well, now, their subsequent, they had some, some battles, uh, but uh, basically that set, set the tone, and we have always had a good relationship with the Tektronix people in those days. So we were accustomed at the county level to accommodating that kind of thing if it was coming upon. I don't want to suggest that I'm totally responsible Silicon Forest, but uh, it was that was the thing that really took off, and partly it was because of being ready to ready to receive them. You made it easy. So that's uh, an urbanization issue. But to imagine that we have well, how many cities do we have? Two hundred and forty-two or something UTVs. Yeah. In Oregon. Yeah. I mean, some are just you know pinpricks. Yeah. But those places are ready for if urban development. Yeah. Uh, which, is, which is happening and is coming even to some of these other places. Yes. Who would have thought, for example, that you have these uh, big uh, uh, distribution centers out there that have that take on the high energy out in, right. along the gorge? Right. And, right. Uh, and I doubt if I'm, Amazon's going to locate in Oregon, but there we might get a distribution center some of these days. Right. So we're ready. We're ready for it. Right. Up to a point. I gotta go. You gotta go. Okay. Yeah, head up. You bet. This guy Thanks for straightening me out on the Metropolitan Service District. Okay. He's quite a. Going to edit this, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any land use policies, subjects, or topics that are missing from comprehensive plans through the LCDC statewide planning program? I don't think I don't think so. I mean, you may have to stretch some stuff, but uh, if you want to address it at the at the at the local level, I don't think there's any any problem. Uh, and finding a, a I would, category. I would have said yes, because there's no protection for the coast. Until we got the coastal goals. Four goals. Yeah, coast. yeah, but the, was, you know, they're all there. They're and all written very, very well. Yeah, they are. And Jim Ross and his people over there. Uh, uh, Ted LaRoe. Ted LaRoe. And, and to no small extent, Ann Squire. Ann Squire. Who is uh, one of the most uh, valuable people that's ever served on anywhere in Oregon. We're working hard, Mike and I, particularly Mike, to get it her inventory. Yeah. yeah, interview. We, we want to get her on, uh, yeah. so to speak, on paper. I think. Yeah. She no, somehow is very reluctant. She'd be the third person, I guess, in terms of just brilliant people. Go ahead. Be besides Neil Goldschmidt, Dave Eccles, and, and Ann Squire. I don't want to overlook her at all. Yeah. She was. There's some other, some other people that, you know, I, I was thinking the other day that people that you run into, uh, Gail Ackerman, you know, she was a talent. Gosh, she was a we talent. We had some awfully good people in the government yeah. office. Uh, yeah, Pat Amadeo helped us out with, with Vic when, she, when he was there. Yeah. And um, it's, it, there's, 
Well, as you know, uh, we have had pretty consistent support for this program from the governor's office, regardless of party. Way, all the way along. So even, long. even Vic. Yeah. Okay, in 1974, LCDC and DLCD undertook the unprecedented public outreach and involvement effort in adopting the first 14 goals. I think you've got to answer yeah. this, but it wasn't worth doing. And uh, let's see, did it affect your, th let's see. yeah, I guess it wasn't worth doing. Yeah. And of course you Well, you know, that whole, that was, that was, that was Arnold's strong suit, Arnold Kogan, the first director. Uh, and had, he laid that out pretty well. We need to listen. Here's what we heard the second round, mm -hmm. and then the third round, and here's where we're, headed. Where, we're where we're going. Yeah. And I thought it was a pretty logical thing. It was, it was incredibly time intensive, but um, it was, uh, I think, successful. And uh, boy, we had a lot of meetings around the state. I think we had a, a, a close to a hundred meetings That's based all say. three rounds. Amazing. Um, because I think we almost always had 30 plus in a, in a, in a set. It was, it was formidable. And of course, that last meeting in December of... What, well, the public, you're talking about the room, room 50 meeting? The, last, the final commission meeting on the rolls. Yeah. And who do we have at the table at the beginning? You tell me. Governor Tom Carl and Bob, and Bob, Bob Strop came in hand in hand, almost side literally. by side. Re Republican on the way out. Yeah, Democrat on the way in. On the way in, but they were both just like that. Yeah, and I felt so proud. Uh, I'm sure a lot of other people were of Oregon's politics. Could yeah, sort of lay the politics yeah. aside and just come in and say this ought to be done. For but in, in some certain ways. Uh, Bob Straub was a stronger environmentalist mm -hmm. than right. Tom McCall was. Tom McCall was a more practical politician and a more charismatic uh, leader. Right. Uh, but uh, Tom, uh, uh, Bob Straub was no, slouch, no slouch when it came to uh, environmental values, and he had good environmental people around him. Yeah. Janet McClendon, for one. Yeah. Well, here's all the uh, governor's staff people uh -huh. that we have a list of. Oh, that's interesting. On the, on, the, on the right side there. I don't know why Straub's name is on the other list, right opposite. It's the other governors, but it's not Straub. Uh, yeah. I don't know why that is. Uh, do you believe the statewide planning goal struck the balance between state and local control that LCDC intended in 1974? I think what they, yeah, I think it's what was intended. It wasn't acceptable to some people. There were some two-bit politicians, in the words of a famous former chairman of our commission who will be forever remembered LB. for that purpose, LB, LB Day. Uh, and there were some uh, people that played, wanted to play games about it. And uh, it was some demagoguery, I think, basically on the, on the, on the, at the local level. They felt threatened. They were gonna have to make some tough decisions their decisions where people win and people lose. Uh, let's face it, that comprehensive planning makes winners and losers in some ways. Yeah. And uh, they, a lot of these, a lot of these public officials, and I, I can speak with some authority about how the, the maelstrom that you're in, uh, don't like to make decisions and make people unhappy. And sometimes they don't, sometimes they react only to who's ever present in the room. Not who, not the general public or even the people that haven't even been born yet, which is a responsibility I think local officials have. Mm -hmm. How do you think Oregon's land use program in 2018 compares with what was envisioned four decades ago? What question you would like? Uh, Tim. I think it's on course. Um, it um, isn't on the ballot. That's a good sign, and it has been, and we all know how that, how tough those battles were. So I think there's general uh, public acceptance. I think uh, local government has pretty much stepped up and, and realizes what they have to do and do it. They do it. Um, I don't know of any 
recalcitrant jurisdictions that aren't at least playing at the game a little bit, some better than others. But uh, there's, you know, there's these pressures, demographic pressures that we felt so strongly back in the uh, late uh, 60s and, and early 70s are, are, are on us again. And, and uh, they're big challenges and they, they're going to take some gutty decisions by local officials. And the state isn't going to bail them out in particular. I wish we had a better grasp of what's going on. Evaluation is the key. Word. Ah, good point. And I don't know why. Is that activity, the evaluation process, pretty well uh, suspended? Uh, well, or has it ever started? started yet? I don't know if it ever. Well, we had reports. We had some sense of. Uh, There's a lot going on in metro areas. Yeah, you know, more but, populated areas, but the other areas, I don't think. Are yeah, much uh, they were. And why shouldn't the state be initiating that? Yeah, I think it would almost be better if it, it wouldn't be LCDC initiated, well, but maybe out of the governor's office or the economic development or somebody that's well, not maybe a, a joint governor's office uh, legislative. Effort. Yeah, or legislative uh, affairs uh, people. So at least we have to good point. A good point. Have to share, but Mike and I are out of it, right? These yeah, days, in terms of what's really going on over there. Well, that's. And that's a whole other discussion. You know, this whole question of this whole question of measurement of, of uh, evaluation. evaluation and some sense of have any of these jurisdictions adopted any kind of uh, measurable outcomes in terms of how well their plan is performing? And then it's a local responsibility, it seems to do to do that. Uh, this well, whole question of uh, if you can't measure the outcomes, how do you know that you've got anything? Working. Should legislatures, or um, excuse me, uh, schools, yeah, universities ever be brought into that process? I don't know. That's well, it, it would. It would I'd like to. Sh what you're doing is it's not just having the the agency alone. No, I don't think because so. Because otherwise, think it anything that's good, well, of course it would be good, yeah. and anything that's bad, we yeah, we wouldn't talk, talk about it. So, but I think getting some shared responsibility. Well, I think that's a good idea. And, and be, it'd be and nice to know, even a perception of, of some public opinion polling of the community, what do they think is happening and how well it's working for What about every other uh, you know, legislative session? We do that kind of an evaluation. We don't, but I'm saying. Yeah, somebody so, does. Yeah. And so that's brought to the legislature. Now, well, I agree with you. Maybe that would not be well received by some. Yeah. Because no, a thousand friends saw it and says, Wait a minute, Agland or something yeah. like that, or, or, or housing, you know, Fred still yeah. out there. And, uh, one, of the interesting, uh, one of the interesting things I was thinking about is the kind of the different view now that uh, after a while that uh, the timber industry had about this program. As we re well remember, they were uh, among the most serious opponents uh, in terms of putting Money into the campaigns to, to repeal the program. Well, we had some, later on. I don't think they were. We had a pretty good guy in there, didn't we? Uh, at 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 Forestry. Uh, Ward Armstrong. Ward and, Armstrong. And at uh, AOI. Yeah. And uh, yes. the Forestry people were okay, but I think that I think the companies came to, the, with the exception of some, uh, came to the conclusion that. Uh, Maybe keeping housing out of the forest is not a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. And at least that part of the program they buy into. So, and that's something you can do uh, with a comprehensive plan. And that actually helped. It took a while, um, and you had some timber companies that were yeah never on board. No, and you had others that were actually yeah. Really Stimson will never be on board. Very good supporters. And Seneca was the one that's <laughs> a little bit of a problem. Yeah, it always will be. But uh, anyway, but champion and then we had some really well laminate industries. Yeah, had some really good support. Yeah, I think even Weyerhaeuser at the end came around to have some sense of civic responsibility. Yeah. There was a report the other day that timber production and sales is at the highest peak in a long time. Really? And I'm not saying who's doing right or wrong. Yeah. It's just, that was the report about the uh, output. Well, the value has gone up. The yeah. tariff issues caused the down value of timber to go crazy. Yeah. And so, and then there's demand. We're getting a lot yeah, more sure it's houses. Sure, yeah.
Uh, some Oregon land use observers believe the approval of SB 100 was possible because of the time period in which we lived, the 1970s, in the environmental movement. The enactment occurred because of the conveyance of four key factors, vision, leadership, federal money, and luck. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Do you agree or disagree? And do you believe there were other factors that were critical to the passage of SB 100? And I'll go to the next one too, which is, do you think it could ever be? Could we have approved it today? Well, I think those are. I think that's an accurate description of what uh, the drivers of, of it. And um, it was also uh, a whole whole lot of people that got involved and pushed for it. I mean, there was there was a fair amount of. Uh, People support, uh, and I guess that not just environmentalists, but right. others. Be, besides that, could it happen today? I, I don't know if it would come out the same way, but I, I would have a hunch that uh, people are starting to appreciate the fact that we're back in another uh, rather rapid growth period, and we probably, if we didn't have our act together then, and, and things had slipped along, it seems to me we'd want to think seriously about getting our act together now. Uh, I think we have our act together, so it's kind of a hard thing to, yeah. uh, to judge. Uh, I think, I, as, as was pointed out, we do have the urban growth boundaries in place, so we know where the land development is going to occur. Uh, if we hadn't, didn't, hadn't done it then, we sure would want to do it now. Yeah. And we have certain except, exception areas that can be used also for Yeah. Yeah, there's at all. Yeah. Thing, so. That's the thing that always bugged me is that people didn't realize how flexible this program really was or could be. If you went through it again, making some findings and facts, some conclusions about the law, and uh, uh, make your case, uh, there's a, there's a lot of things you could you could do to ease ease some of the pinch points. But uh, I never I never felt that that was properly appreciated. I just thought that some people just thought that they were going to be hamstrung and that was the end of it. And so there therefore you can't do any you don't want to do anything. Right. And that's those that's never the that's never the solution. Is the state land use program equipped to address and properly respond to major changes in Oregon such as population growth, the economy, climate change, affordable housing <coughs> in the next thirty to forty years? Tools are there. The will to do it is the important thing. Or do you think changes are needed? No. I think you've got what you need if you want to do it. The framework's there. Basically. The framework is there. Yeah. yeah, the framework is there. Uh, for example, the, uh, the whole question of sea level rise. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of education and information that needs to get out there. But you look at the, you look at the coastal goals, there's some, there's some good provisions in there in terms of protection. Uh, we've got. Uh, they're, they're they're well written too. Exactly. Yeah, and they're clear. And they're structured. And yeah, so they're clear. Uh, there might have to be some implementing legislation on some of these some of these things, but uh, uh, didn't take uh, I previous governors uh, too much time to figure out in terms of bluff erosion what what was going to happen, what wasn't going to happen, and. I think that I think the tools are there. Uh, is it noticeable your role with NOAA? Yeah. Is it noticeable between Oregon and the other states and how they manage the coast? Well, <clears throat> NOAA was, of course, really quite pleased at the um, the detail that the coastal goals demonstrate, uh, and uh, it was it's easy to point to the Oregon program as a, as a model in some ways, as a good, one of the better programs in the country. Um, the interesting thing is that, you can have that back one yeah, yep. is that um, the, the coastal program, I mean, in this dig, I have to get it in, the coastal program for a long time Helped uh, subsidize the rest of the oh, yeah. of the state program, and uh, as a result, there wasn't as much of the resource spent in the coastal zone as might have been. Now, it was legal and, and appropriate uh, in some ways, but uh, we never really, I think, concentrated the efforts that we might need to in terms of basically helping some of those communities understand what 
what the prob problems are. There was a, there been a couple of initiatives in terms of resilient communities and uh, climate change issues, but it kind of fits and starts and the money runs out and you never have a continuing effort on it. And, but the, so the, the resources run out, but the problem is gonna run out. The problem's gonna be greater and greater. And some communities have taken it on themselves. Seaside is one of them. It's a very positive approach to these things. But a lot of them are not. A lot of them are sleeping over there, and they are going to need to get on with it. And it, it's, it's, it's a tragedy that uh, I think uh, an overzealous environmental effort that uh, initiated a lawsuit uh, on the whole question of coastal non-point source pollution uh, with NOAA, the fact that the Forest Practices Act is not up to snuff, right. caused the coastal program to suffer about a, a significant uh, reduction in resources. Now, we all know that the Land Conservation Development Department and Commission are no match for the Board of Forestry and the Forest Practices Act. We can talk about it, but that's that's a different ball game. That's a different universe, and they're not going to get changed. Their, their rules are not going to get changed because of what might lose a little money over at LCDC. Well, and the, they already did that back with what thirty-three ninety-six, or was that the, legis the legislation yeah. back when? Yeah. Remember, he wrote that big report on. Gold well, and we wanted out from under that. Yeah, we did, but. We should be penalized for things that we can't control, and uh, I, f I felt that that was a, a, a sad day when that money went away and we couldn't use it in terms of uh, coastal communities. Yeah. And so sometimes uh, uh, the logic isn't doesn't help you. So where, where, where were we on that? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you an aside here. I hadn't realized this before, but uh, when we were making a presentation at Portland State winter term uh, dealing with uh, hazards, natural yeah. hazards, um, the last acknowledged plan came in 1986, yeah. and that's when they discovered the Cascadia subduction zone. So our plans, none of our plans react to yeah. Cascadia. Yeah. And it was like, because I, I always kind of wonder, Goal 7 really was never developed yeah. to the degree that it needed to be well, to address that. And that's interesting. I, I, uh, I thought that, that that was part of our part of our knowledge, but it wasn't part of the knowledge no. base for planning. You know? No, they didn't. Because I, I can hear the guys at Oregon State, particularly Jim yeah. Good and others, talking about yeah. the big one. And, yeah. Uh, you know, the big one, last one was in 1700 right. in Japan, and right. all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, John Morrow, who is yeah. uh, our, our guy over in Hawaii, uh, and uh, uh, he, was a, he was a good field rep over there, talked about, talked about uh, setbacks and uh, yeah. buffering community, and, and got actually people to change their plans in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, he knew what he was talking about. You know, doing management. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is your view about the future of Oregon's land use program? Do you believe Oregonians have accepted the state land use program and will continue wanting cities and counties to plan for growth and protect resources through comprehensive planning and zoning? Yeah, I think so. I think we're going to, I think we're going to drive this particular vehicle for uh, a few more thousand miles. And uh, I don't see why not. Um, there's some changes you can make, I suppose. If we, I don't know what the, I don't know what the raw points are at this at this juncture, uh, but um, again, it's there, and if local government wants to to use it, they can certainly, you know, there's a hundred different ways you can yeah. do a plan, and uh, I don't think that was ever totally appreciated by some. Uh, that uh, they had a whole lot of flexibility that they didn't want to exercise. Within the framework of So Within the framework of the goals. Yeah. On the other hand, as you may also remember, we had a lot of plans that looked very similar to one another yeah. based on the consultants that, uh, that uh, 
did the plans. One of the things that I think I, one of the regrets I think I have, uh, and they're not very many, that no, I would, nor would I admit to very many, but I don't think we appreciated the thinness of the talent that was out there to do really good work. I think we expected more of local government than they could reasonably produce. In fact, we probably contributed to that by hiring some of the better planners to work for DLCD. And there wasn't a, a big enough reservoir of competent planners out there to get the, to get the job done very quickly. Yeah. Uh, it got done eventually. 86, did you say? Yeah. What was the last jurisdiction? Oh, boy. Forgot the end of that. <clears throat> Good uh, Eastern Oregon. Well, I want to say maybe Jackson County or somebody else. Jackson County maybe. somewhere. I, I'm just guessing. Oh, really? I don't want to blame them, but... Uh, so that, that was, I, I think we expected too much. Maybe we're too, maybe we're too hard on them. But on the other hand, how hard, how hard could it have been, really? Yeah. It, the threshold was pretty low. What's amazing is to see what we would have accomplished if we had the technology of today, GIS, oh, yeah. and, and then started the program yeah. back when we did. You know, one of the other things, and I'm not, I don't apologize for this, is that at some points along the line, I think the commission was too forgiving. They were willing to accept, accept some stuff that just really wasn't all that good. And I think we did a pretty good job of talking them out of it. The staff was pretty strong in those oh, yeah, days. Um, and uh, we didn't lose very many battles. Uh, and the one battle that we didn't necessarily win wasn't that much of a problem anyway, and that was the Metropolitan Urban Growth Boundary, which uh, I thought uh, Bob Stacy did maybe the best presentation I ever heard in public on a planning issue mm -hmm. on that. And I think maybe the second best was Greg Winteround, who uh, yeah. was, the, was the responder on that one, our, our guy. Yeah. And that was high level stuff. Yeah. And win or lose, it didn't really make a whole lot of difference. It seemed like it time but it really didn't make that much difference because it was a pretty good pretty good boundary. I have a question to ask. Go ahead. This is about state agency coordination. State agency coordination. Okay, here we go. Isn't it surprising that he would ask that no, question? No, it's not surprising. <laughs> I don't even have it written down. <laughs> well you can always just ignore it then. Uh, key questions in terms of the issues. <clears throat> is SAC is envisioned by L C D C still relevant today? Well, I think it's incri incredibly relevant. Relevant, okay. Two, can the state's interest still be reflected through comprehensive land use planning today? State agency coordination is a Can the state's interest still be reflected through comprehensive pl land use planning today? Talking about the state's interest is a very tricky issue. I agree. Sometimes I don't know what that is. Yeah. What I do know is that, the, uh, is that um, state agency coordination and the willingness of state agencies to coordinate in the planning process, either locally or providing input to DLCD during the plan review process, or in this case it would be periodic review, I guess. That's a whole other discussion. Uh, that's a function of government, uh, that's a function of governor's leadership. And if you don't have it, and the governor's staff doesn't communicate it, it won't happen. Right. Number three, if you had the authority to enact changes to SAC, what changes would you make? To the state agency? If, or you, have state agents, if you had the authority to enact changes <coughs> excuse me, to state agency coordination, what changes would you make? And four, with respect to state agency coordination, what is working effectively and what isn't? So I don't. These are more or less rhetorical. Yeah, they are, and I think I answered it by suggesting what I think that the only way that it can work. <clears throat> and um, this governor, uh, surprisingly, seems to have taken hold and made some significant changes in terms of agency directors. Directors. 
directors. But do the directors understand what their agency is? Uh, well, that's, uh, you know, that the governor's office and the governor's natural resources coordinator has got to buy into this concept and it'd be willing to take the gaff that, uh, that the agency is going to feed back to, to him or her because they're going to, they're going to, they're going to resist it to some degree. If it isn't in their specific uh, mandate and legislative uh, um, direction. Now, you could change their legislative mandate, I suppose. Yeah, I don't think it is. But I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. And so, I, again, I think it comes back to the question of whether the governor's office <clears throat> is going to crack the whip on state and, agencies. And, and to achieve certain things. So. To achieve, and what is it that you want to uh, achieve? And I think what you want to achieve is whatever the state interest right. might be. And what is the state interest? Well, they're articulated in the goals. Yes, in an indirect way as far as every agency. Yeah, in there. In some agencies, it doesn't relate to them at all. That's the right. Those are right, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. Yeah. You'd want, you know, you'd want forestry, you'd want DEQ, uh, and you'd get on, get on board, and there's act a in a consistent way. Fish and wildlife, and there's, there's like the top ten or so. Yeah, <coughs> fish and wildlife. You know, it's always been an elusive issue, and it's been, it's, I don't want to say it's a pipe dream, but it's an unrealized, uh, logical, but just not, mm. just not politically. Uh, I like to think that the agencies would want to do this. To enhance their own, you'd be surprised. I I was surprised how stovepiped and and isolated even sub agencies within a big department yeah, can yeah, get in yeah. terms of their own mission and in terms of coordinating with uh, their office next door. I found that in spades at NOAA. Yeah, that's <laughs> interesting what you're saying because we've had the seminar on uh, safety coordination. Yeah. Greg Wolf was here with uh, Bob and Jim uh, and uh, Rick Bastas. It's exactly what they said. Yeah. They said. You know, we have this period of time where state agencies are really communicating well through the land use program. Yeah, they communicated by and, reviewing plans. And things, things were, like that. They, they all <laughs> said things were working great. Right? Yeah. Now, at least their perception, they're all retired, but yeah. their perception is everyone's gone back to their silos and they're, yeah. they're not doing it. Yeah. That's, a, that's where evaluation, that's the, the big E word, yeah. is out there. Well, and you need a governor to say, no, yeah. you're all going to be involved. Yeah. You, know, you right. need to have some leadership on that. Well, you'd think, for example, that Fish and Wildlife might want to take a look at, uh, at Gold 5 and see what, what's going on there. Yeah. And, and, and report back. Now, maybe right. they do, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, relationship to the, the values of Fish and, the Fish and Wildlife Department vis-a-vis -vis a local plan, How's that, how's that matching up? And there's goal six, water. Yeah. That's a huge issue. There. Oh, yeah, even water supply. No water supply and quality, obviously. Yeah, and yeah. That's a whole other discussion. And, and well, they just for you can do some things, but not everything. No. You know, and. Yeah, That's where evaluation comes in. Well, you, God, that, that, you know, some of these, some of these organizations, Again, they they have their own life and their own their own uh, values. Well, the interest groups should come out and, and lock arms and say, "Here's some things we want to yeah we want to have done." So, I, 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 I believe. Yeah, I don't know. I yeah, I don't think there's much. I don't think there's much taste for that right now. No, there never was. Never was. Well, that's why the leadership from the yeah, so I, I think so. It took individuals and, and the agencies, some of those key agencies, that forestry yeah. or water resources or... Well, you know, I, one of the things that I saw in terms of the state's interest was, an int and it was, a, it was a, in microcosm, a small, small gauge. When I went off to do the ocean plan, you know, we had uh, a, a committee, a, a coordinating committee mm -hmm. of the key agencies. And uh, people like Fred Hansen would really take a really took a role in that. He did. And uh, Fish and Wildlife. I oftentimes I think it was Neil Cohen that represented him, so he was good. But uh, the uh, the agency people that were represented on that uh, on that uh, board, uh, were able to, and Fred particularly was able to transcend his own agency. 
Well, it was very difficult to do. Is. Very difficult. It takes some leadership. Yeah. And, and, and lots of issues out there for the governor to deal with, so yeah. it may be too much to expect. But on the other Yeah, hand, ours is a pretty small. It would be good to have at least an evaluation done to come back and say, here's what's good yeah. and here's what needs to be fixed. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I agree. Right. So, Mike, go ahead. Last question. Okay. Uh, and it's similar to what Jim talked about, savings coordination, but, uh, okay, you have the chance to influence the development of a new comprehensive land use planning program. What lessons from Oregon's approach would you borrow, and which ones might you avoid? Avoid well. Well, as I said, you got to have a transparent, open process, <coughs> first of all. Hear me. You've got, you've got to come forward with good, reliable data, and you need to field test that and, and, and make sure that you, what you've got is accurate. I remember one time in, when we went out with our comprehensive plan in uh, uh, Washington County, we went up, we had the zoning maps with us, the old zoning maps, and the proposed new, the new boundaries. And we go up and talk to some people, and then it's more than once guy would come up and say, well, you know, yeah, that's right, but there's a, you know, there's a stream here, or there's a, a, ro a road that you've missed, and the point was, okay, ground truth it, and change it. So, again, transparency, openness, willingness to listen to what people have to say is just absolutely important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but, you have to, then you have to, you have to Make some decisions and yeah, not let the process <coughs> linger for <coughs> <our. Yeah. coughs> Is there any aspect of the program you think that we did that we should have done differently um, if you had the chance to do it again? Oh, I suppose if I can. think about it and come back to us. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do think we we I do think we asked an awful lot of local government in a in a relatively short time. Yes. In a, in a world that they were not prepared to live in altogether or didn't understand. And part of the problem, we were fighting, not only did we, we have a, a responsibility to the local government folks to get the planning going, we had these other forces out here that were trying to do us evil. And you had to fight on both, both of those things. And that's, Inevitable for a new program, I guess, and when it's as controversial as land use, which is, let's face it, it's not, it's no. not for the timid. Yeah, very controversial. It's, uh, it's tough. It's, it's interesting tough. you say that because me, I started in local government. I yeah. Planning, and I think from my standpoint.